Could uh, just get everyone to take their seats, please, if we could. We're about to start, so if you could take your seats, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. Australian music, 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 music. Music industry insights. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to AIM Insights. Um, we welcome our live audience uh, here at AIM. Um, oh. Wow. 
I don't think that's ever happened before. Um, we welcome everybody watching on live stream and those watching later on catch up or at listening to our podcast. Before we begin, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We pay our respects uh, to their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, tonight, we're coming to you live from Gadigal country. Our guest tonight is someone who has achieved enormous success over the past five years as an artist manager, uh, an independent label boss. The word unprecedented gets overused in our industry um, quite a lot these days, but the success that he uh, enjoyed with a particular artist, Tones and I, I think truly is literally unprecedented. Um, I think it's one of the most successful singles in the history of the music business, so I think it's a fair word to use. There's much more to this man's story than one song, so please join me in welcoming Regan Lethbridge. Thank you. So, Regan, welcome, and thanks for coming down from Byron Bay to join us. Thank you for having me. You've sort of got Byron Bay footwear. I do. I'll put my foot down. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's well, it's good. It's, it's relaxed. It's yeah, summer. It is. Um, so we begin all of these stories by asking people how they, how they got their start in the music business. And you got your start in the music business as an artist, right? I did, yeah. I um, started playing guitar when I was 14 years old and, and became really chummy with um, a couple of high school buddies. And we decided to give it a crack overseas. So we moved to Melbourne in 2006. And... Um, we played professionally for around 10 years and it was during that time that we met artists like the Pierce Brothers and Tash Sultana and um, a bunch of people that we ended up um, managing. But yeah, it, it was a crazy time and it was, it was a lot of fun but it just came to its kind of natural end. Uh, we just started having kids and just wanted to, to do something different and kind of um, go on the other side of the fence, I guess. So the band, from memory, didn't get a... You didn't have a record deal? We didn't have a record deal. We were distributed. Um, well, we had. We were independent, firstly yep. via MGM and then Inertia. So we had, we were indie. Um, but you, I suppose. I mean, you know, apologies for being this granular, but were you able to make a decent living as a as a as an act playing live? At we that lived point? off it professionally for ten years, but like yeah. we went from earning fifty dollars each a week to one fifty, and we, you know, we weren't making crazy money, but we were doing what we loved, and and we toured around Australia a lot. Um, Japan, we went to once, uh, Europe, all that sort of stuff. So it just, we, we didn't know at the time, but it was, it was just a good kind of way of getting out there and learning the ways and just walking the walk instead of um, trying to advise people later on about things that you know nothing of, you know. And we never got past kind of seven or 800 capacity rooms, but we played a bunch of festivals and stuff. But it was still kind of a good way to cut your teeth and kind of learn about the, the, the world of music. It was a crash course in yeah. real life, yeah. And, and were, you, were you managing the band as well? We were self-managing. I started yeah. off managing, and then obviously my business partner now, Dave Morgan at Lemon Tree, we did it together for, for many years. Um, we had a manager in the early days, and it didn't work out. We just did it ourselves. Yeah. Mm. We took it as far as we could kind of go and made, made a lot of mistakes, and I I'd hopefully never made them twice. So d did you feel like when you were, when you were touring, and, and I believe doing quite a lot of busking as well, but were you thinking, how do we break through the barrier to the next level and become like a big act? It's, it's all we thought about, to be honest. It's, yeah. um, it was just, we'd bus three or four times a week for maybe five years. It was, and we did that because we got to Melbourne, we bought a van, we put three months rent down on a house and we didn't want to get jobs. So we uh, thought it was great just to go get a busking permit and we made decent money. We made a, whatever it was, a few grand a week and our music started to spread and our shows started to sell out. So we, we found that to be a way of getting our music out there and we just thought stuff the stigma and, and we gave it a crack. And, and that's how we met a lot of our lifelong friends as well, who we're still good friends with today. So what is it about the busking experience? Because this, this will return as a theme throughout the next hour, I suspect. Um, what is it about the busking experience that's different to going and playing a show at, in, a, in, a, in a pub? Well, I mean, obviously the foot traffic is... I mean, you can potentially be seen or heard by hundreds of thousands of people a day, even if it's passive, even if they're just walking past and they, they see you um, briefly or whatever it may be. They can go, oh, that was that band I saw back in the day. Or we, just have, we used to have a big blackboard written and our band name where we were playing next CDs, $10 or whatever it was. And it was just a great way to get 
uh, our music directly to people and we'd do signings after and all that sort of stuff and we just grew a little fan base and, 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 and we reinvested all of that money into touring Australia and building a, 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 little, a little vibe and a little fan base and then eventually Triple J came on board and um, yeah, it was just, I mean, looking back, those are the best memories of the busking days, the early days, yeah. I suppose, do you need a different kind of work ethic, is I suppose what I'm getting You just, at. you want it more, like, yeah, I can't explain, like, the majority of our acts now on Lemon Tree, we've got nine signings, they were, um, most of them, if not all of them, had a busking background, and it's that, uh, you want it more, you hit the streets, you... You don't, you're not doing it because you have to, you're doing it because you want to, because you've got a passion of music, you can try out new songs, you can, I don't know, you can play to the masses and just hone your craft and you can see if people stop and listen for a certain song, you know, yeah, there might be something there or, yeah. I don't know, Tash and Tones are the masters of this, but we just did it back in the day and it worked for us, not on their level, but it was, it's a great way to get a foot in the door, you kind of, uh, if you can't get signed or whatever it was, we just, you've got to make your own luck. So tell me about, so you, you, eventually you decided to, to um, stop doing the band and create a management company. So I think originally you were booking, booking artists as an agent, right? Yes, so um, got asked to be uh, an agent at 123 Agency. So I was there for maybe six years and I started off booking Pierce Brothers and then they were saying, oh, there's this artist on Burke Street called Tash Sultana that you've got to check out. She came in for a meeting, I started booking Tash. And the first show I think we booked for Tash was at She Bean in Melbourne uh, and it was 150 capacity and it sold out straight away and I was like, oh geez, and that was huge at the time. And we put on a second show and then that sold out and then we did all the clubs around Melbourne and then it just was pretty evident that there was a vibe there and she had, there was no radio, there was no nothing, it was just purely off word of mouth from busking and that was kind of like a light bulb moment of you don't have to be this huge radio act to firstly have a career or make a decent living off music or I mean musicians ask any musician they the, the number one thing is usually what do you want to do you want to play live around the world you know that the streams and stuff are all great but I think what it boils down to is they love performing so much they want to get out of bed and go play you know if, or be in the studio you know what I mean it's like they just want to play their instrument or sing or use their talent and be creative yeah and not sit around doing nothing yeah exactly so We'll get back to Tash because that's an incredible story. But what was the vision when you when you founded Lemon Tree Music? Well, I mean, did you have a kind of a well articulated N game plan? No, the opposite. Yes. Yeah, so that was 2013, I think. And um, my business partner Dave, who was the bass player in the band, uh, decided to start Lemon Tree Music. And that was a, a town in New Zealand where we rehearsed a lot. It just had a we loved the name, and um, we had no grand plan. We just wanted to take on clients and just really serve them as best we could and try and make something of it. And uh, for our first client was the Pierce Brothers and they did incredible things in the early days and we'll forever be thankful for them for giving us a shot and then obviously that led, led to, to bigger and better things. But we're, they're still our clients now, we love them like family. So looking back, it, it looks like it was like this well orchestrated grand plan but the whole thing was just trial and error and just giving it a go when we had nothing else going on really. But at some point, I'm assuming you did develop a bit of a, a kind of, uh, what's the word, a set of principles for Lemon Tree. Because if you look at the artists that you've attracted to Lemon Tree, and you now have a management company, a record company, uh, you do publishing, you do live booking, there, there's, a, there's a sort of common theme to all of those things, which is that you're, you're maintaining your artist's independence. You're not signing away their rights for years and years. There is a, there is a bit of a sort of theme to all of that. Yeah, I mean, we don't have publishing, but we're, we're, we're pretty close on that. But yeah, I, I, that's the gist of it. We wanted to create an artist-friendly company that always had the artist's uh, vision and integrity first because the manager's just got to remember you're working for them, they don't work for you. It's your job to bring their vision to life, not your own. And we just said from the outset that we wanted just to basically work our asses off and um, it took, I don't know, I don't even know how, seven or eight years or whatever it was until we had a bit of success, but it was a lot of grind and we loved it and um, I don't regret a single day of doing it. So, you know, managing acts is often a thankless task, right? Um, and not only thankless, but actually rewardless because plenty of people manage acts and 
basically make almost no money at all out of it. So it, it takes, there's a bit of perseverance required to even be a manager. There is, yeah. It takes a long time to get something back, often years. I mean, maybe three to five years you start to see a bit of a return or if you're lucky in the first couple. But you're investing in your own future and you're hedging your bets. And we've always been a less is more approach. We never wanted to be the model of play the volume game and just throw it at the wall and see what sticks. We really wanted to just have things that have artists that were in their own lane that were just undeniable. Like you hear a lot of good artists, but there's, it just had to have that extra something that you can't explain, a bit of magic or give you goosebumps or you see them live and it just absolutely blows your hair back. Or the, I mean, when um, Harry and Pixie first sent me a video of Tones busking, uh, I literally fell off my chair. Like I've, I was just I was cooked. I was just like, I have to meet with her and be a part of this team and help you know grow the team globally and and um yeah it's just it's it's crazy looking back on it all but it's 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 cool as well like there's no there's no rule book and if there was it got it was thrown out the window yeah so the other thing before we talk about some of those artists that is interesting about your model if you like and lemon tree model is that you're not i mean in the past i think and if you look back to the you know, so-called golden age of the record business, managers tended to be single individuals that were, you know, like a Chris Murphy managing in excess or a John Reed managing Elton John. Your model seems to be much more of a, a team where you've got lots of, lots of partners, lots of collaborators, lots of people that you work with in different contexts. So you'll co-manage one act with one person and, and co-manage another act with a different person. That seems to be a... Um, a much more of a sort of team kind of environment than, than most management companies I can think of. Yeah, and we're, and we're just doing our best to serve the clients. So we try and do relatively short-term deals. We try and keep them as independent for as long as possible so you can build your numbers so that when you do do that deal, it's a favourable deal to the artist. Um, at Lemon Tree, I mean, there's obviously Dave and I, we've got an amazing um, team of staff that have all got their core responsibilities with certain acts and, and we're nothing without the team. We've got Jackson who found Tones Busking and worked with her for a year in the background on her songs and uh, Jadon who we co-managed Tash with in North America, Dave Toothius in Europe who we'd co-managed three or four acts with. So you're nothing without a team and if anyone stands there putting their hand up saying it was me, me, me or whatever, they're full of shit. And it's just, it doesn't exist. You, you need the team, you need you need the promoter, you need the publicist, you need the publishing, you need the label, you need the management, you need the agent, you need the artist on fire, you need everything lining up, and then you need a, an endless output of amazing, undeniable songs, and then add a shitload of hard work on the end again as well. So some of the artist managers that I just mentioned, and there's many others obviously, um, their method of getting a good result out of all of those other people is to be really horrible to them um, and there's a long history of managers sort of um, kicking ass when they go into the record company or whatever. Is that your style? I'm suspecting not. No, we're, no, we're the opposite, yeah. I mean, we, we, it's obviously a very professional relationship but you can't help when you're working so in depth with people to get that personal connection uh, and yeah, I mean, Tash for example is like a little brother and Tony, they're like, they become like family and, you know, families fight but it's very, very rare and it's, um, you love them at the end of the day and you want them to do well and you genuinely go over and above, you give it that extra 10% because you, you actually give a, a crap about their career and that's obviously a good thing. It can be detrimental. You can be too into something and try too hard on certain things and that's when you've got to kind of put your hand up and go, this for, for whatever reason isn't working, whether that's in a live space or a recorded music space and that's happened a bunch of times or you release something and it just takes off and you're like, well, geez, no one saw that coming because... Again, it, it, a lot of the times the people decide or uh, fans decide, or, and that's why streaming's so great. It's even the playing field so much that hits, or what I hate that word, great songs can come from anywhere around the world. So let's talk about Tash Sultana because that was, that was the first real success that you, you saw, global success anyway. And I'm fascinated by the story because Tash Sultana is an artist that hasn't had a lot of radio airplay um, and until fairly recently, not even a lot of press, and yet managed to sell out the most extraordinary venues all over the world uh, and headline, you know, big festivals and play big, big rooms and play places like Coachella. So how did that happen? Because that is really an extraordinary... I don't think it's the story of Tash has really been told in Australia as much as it should be. No, and it's... Tash was definitely bigger overseas than here and probably still is now, to be honest. And 
we had just had the blueprint of everything we do is global. We go direct to fans, we do minimal press, and we let the music do the talking. And that was from day one, and we don't do anything with brands. And that was from day one what we wanted to essentially achieve, and that was kind of our roadmap. And obviously with all the hard work Tash did busking, I mean, I still, again, going back to those clubs, I still remember booking those clubs, and then all of a sudden there was a, a viral video on Facebook that I think it's had tens of millions of views or something. It's crazy, I don't even know what the number is, but that happened, and then the Hottest 100 happened, I think she was third, and it was just this perfect storm, plus you had an artist that was so hungry to play, like Tash lives and breathes live music, everything else is second, like right now she'll be in a studio recording or rehearsing for something, you know what I mean? Like she, the, Tash doesn't have time where it's, she, there was, a, there was a, about a year spent on her record, don't get me wrong, but if Tash had it her way, it would be constant touring around the world. And before we were even on the radio in England, she did three Brixton Academies at 16,500 tickets. And I was there every night. It was a mode, like it was, you're watching your artist that you, that you love and that you started out when it was just busking and then you're in London and you don't hear an Australian accent in the crowd and they're all yeah, and, English and, people just going mad. And for those that don't know, very few Australian artists sell out Brixton Academy three times. Well, even once. It's just, yeah. it's, I yeah. think it's the record for a solo performer, so, yeah. and that was before an album out was, was out as well. That, again, that was just the power of word of mouth, you can never underestimate it. So, here's, I guess, a good moment to talk about COVID for a minute. How is someone like Tash Sultana coping with not playing for a it's year? It's brutal, it's brutal, yeah. It's, uh, there's been focus on other things, there's been focus on uh, sync stuff, there's been focus on uh, more collaborations, there's a few things in the pipeline that Tash would never have explored before, but now there's basically an open book on. So you've got to just make the most of a, a crap situation. And we are trying to have the attitude of looking at it like we can make something of this and we can, uh, you know, with the stuff with the sound and like we're just, we're pivoting to just try and keep, to basically keep reaching people because Tash's brand was live and when you get that taken away from you. But then again, you've got to step back and realise that it's the same for absolutely everyone. And you can still release music, so the recorded music consumption's gone crazy, but we're missing live like no tomorrow. But when it comes back, it'll be like a boom that we've never seen, and it'll be the greatest five years that I've ever seen in my lifetime, and bring I, it on. I hope you're right. I, it, it, it's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen. And, yeah. and I think they had to cancel quite a few shows, right? And, and Really, Tash was in the middle of pivoting to being more of a band set up. Yeah, we, yeah. I mean, Tash had been rehearsing with the band. There was big plans, Europe. It's just the continuous global six to eight month touring that, that Tash had done for the last five years or so, and the rug was pulled. So, yeah, it's a lot of business, and it's it's people's livelihoods, and it's the, I mean, you've got to think of the crew and you, and the whole the promoters overseas. There's a massive ecosystem around a show, and it's the venue, and it's the bars, and it's the merch, and there's you're talking thousands of people on a tour uh, by the, by when it's all said and done and probably, you know, around 100 a night of, you know, they're feeding their families. So it's, 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 it's brutal for sure. So with an artist like Tash, who does the, the quote-unquote artist development piece? You know, d working with the artist on what comes next and who they're working with and, and who they're recording with. And it, it, is that something that you personally are involved with? Um, yeah, definitely involved. But, I mean, Tash has got... Uh, her engineer Rich, they're very close, so he's the engineer. But Tash is very involved now with production and she wants and mixing and and a bunch of stuff. So you join the dots. I mean, Dan Hume, who mixes her record, you know that was all set up um, by management. But once you join those dots, you just go like, we're never going to tell an artist how to write a song or change that bit or do this. It's like you know what you're doing. We trust you with your art. You just trust us with these certain things to help you get from A to B and you don't go too much on that side of the fence. If something's really sticking out to you or annoying you or you don't think it's the right move, you'll put your head up and say, but at the end of the day, you're, they're musicians and they're creative minds and it's something that you kind of just want to let them do their thing on. Yeah, and, and this is an artist who still effectively ha owns their masters and, and is con in control of, of the, the intellectual property that they've created. Yeah. 100%, yeah. yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yeah.
So, okay, it's taken us 20 minutes to reach the tones and eye moment in the conversation, yeah. which I think is quite good, you know. Yeah, like I didn't well. go straight yeah. there. No, that's good. Um, so for those that don't know, I mean, it is worth stating, just for the record, the ridiculous success of Tones and I, um, Dance Monkey, I mean, number one, I think, in over 30 countries, um, seven billion streams, uh, a billion streams on YouTube, uh, as I said earlier, I mean, it, it really is genuinely, literally unprecedented. I think one of the most successful artists, uh, well, sing singles certainly in, in the history of the music business. I mean, you know, bigger than just about anything you can name. But of course, there's a whole story behind that, right? That did, didn't just happen overnight. So how did you b become involved with Tones and I? How, how did that story unfold? So Jackson, her f initially, he's a music lawyer, Jackson walked in Brown was in Byron with his wife having dinner, Tones was busking, card in the guitar case. Tones called him a few months later, moved into his house for around a year, and nine months into that year, word was getting around, Tones was playing locally, and Pixie and Harry, who Harry now books Tones at Lonely Lands Agency, sent me a video of her busking. And as I said, I, it was just, I just had to meet with her and then had a couple of meetings, uh, and it was just a good vibe and just said, look, we'd love to be a part of the team. This is before she'd released any music or uh, she was literally just busking and playing small shows around and just cutting her teeth. Um, but she just had this army of incredible songs and it just was a feeling like we just have to be involved. We just knew we could help take her songs global and just be a small piece of that puzzle to, to get her music out. And um, and then had a great couple of meetings. Then she supported the Pierce Brothers and Kingscliff. And I just, I remember backstage just having a good chat. I just was basically begging. I was like, just give us a go. Fire us after six months if you're not into it. I can't remember exactly what I said. It was something like that. And she said yes. And then we signed in January. And then we f dropped her first song, Johnny Runaway, in March. And fed it through Unearthed and serviced it to Triple J and set her up with her own label and flew around the world a few times with her to meet with every man and woman under the sun in label land and it was just a, one of the craziest rides. I'm, I still cannot process it now, how nuts it was for about 18 months and then I was in that center with her when COVID hit and we all had to come home but um, she's just, it's, it's all credit to Tones. Her, her songs have traveled around the world and Dance Monkey was just this freak thing that um, I don't think we'll ever, I mean who knows. I think it's like the second or the third biggest stream song ever and but she, she prides herself on being live and she, she loves, she's sold out theatres around the world. So we're just beginning that story. Like everyone's like dance monkey, but it's, that's just the start. It's like we're so excited to set up the career artist and there's an album coming this year and there's just a million things that we want to do and that we're going to do. And um, she's just a brilliant songwriter with a voice that just stands out, I guess. So, I mean, it's, it's worth just thinking about that for a moment because, I mean, a lot of the people in the room here or, or watching later will, will sort of say, you know, I've got music uh, that I think is pretty good. What is it that ignites that, that passion in you that, that would make you want to sign an artist? What is it that stood out for you with her that, that was so amazing? Her voice just got me straight away. I, I think she was singing a cover. I can't remember. I just remember just her voice and just seeing crowds and I just, yeah, it's just, and it, I think not having anything in that lane on, the, on your roster and just having obviously the time and the energy because if you take on something new, you want to give it the full service, you want to throw everything at it. And, um, and when I met her, I just, I just loved her. She was just a, a, a beautiful person and you could just see in her eyes that she was, she was ready to go for it and, and she wanted to go global and, and again, she had an army of songs and she... Uh, She's just, she's an undeniable talent and she would have got there eventually, it might have just taken longer. We did, all we did was set things up, we joined the dots, we set up the teams and, and um, yeah, we can't sit here and take credit for anything, it's, it's her songs. She would have got there eventually. Did you meet resistance? I mean, when you first started walking her around the world and, t and setting up meetings with people, were people looking at you and going, geez, Regan, I mean, this, this is really going to be tough or did everyone get it straight away? Most, 99% of people got it. Um, one or two labels didn't, but that's fair. But we met with everyone. There was endless phone calls that Jackson, Dave and I did. Um, and we settled on Electra, which is Warners for Overseas, because they were the most passionate. And they really believed in her vision. And it was, a, it was Tones' call at the end. It's, it's a manager's job just to present those opportunities and get each respective deal to the point where you think 
that it's right for them, and then it's their job to tell us what they want to do. Like, we'd never say, you need to do that. It's like, here's this, this, and this. What do you do? What does your gut feel? All that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I, there's just two questions, I guess, that I have about tones. And I one is, how do you... Uh, it's, so being that successful that quickly uh, can really do strange things to people's heads. It's, it's quite an intimidating thing to go through, to be globally famous. So I'm interested to know, as a manager, how do you help an artist through that process? Well, I mean, you, it's, it's hard because you, no one's gone through that like they are. Like, you know what I mean? There's one thing every year or every couple of years that just goes into orbit like that from all around the world that you... you your job is just to... You're essentially... You're a, you can act as a counsellor. You just blanket them with love. You try and block out the noise as much as possible. And you just keep feeding them wins and keep them motivated. And as long as you're staying true to their vision, then you can't go wrong. And as long as there's no lies and there's no crap, it's just if you build that trust, it becomes unbreakable. And then there's that trust. And they know that if you're, if, if you're booking a tour in Europe and they know that it's going to be the right rooms or the right promo, it's less is more. And there's just, I don't know, we'd need a day to talk about this sort of stuff. And there's no, there's no, it's a, it's a very hard question to answer. Well, I mean, I think one of the things you see with, with artists when they blow up like that is that they get overworked. They just they have to be in too many places over too many months and it just burns them out. Yeah, and that was definitely something that... It not only tones, like, the team, like, the whole management team, even the label, like, everyone was kind of feeling it after a year, but you just, you're running on adrenaline and you're, you're, you're working crazy hours and you know that what you're doing is helping in some small way, like you're a tiny cog in a big wheel and a machine. And, um, you know, her music was resonating with that many people. It was, it was just a spin out. And so the other question I wanted to ask is, is what happens, you know, sometimes when you have a really big hit like that, uh, and in fact there are very few hits as really big as that, uh, there's sometimes a, a tendency for there to be a backlash uh, and, you know, the, the sort of one hit wonder type accusations start to fly around and radio can get sick of you or people can get sick of you so how do you protect against that we just block out the noise i mean you can't control what the artist reads but we just i mean never seen the rain the follow-up song streamed something like half a billion or something crazy flyaways almost at 100 million so i think that now is shutting up a lot of that kind of chatter um but when you do on the other side of the coin is when you do have a song as big as dance mike and it gets that big, it's so big that you just, you can't control it and you can't control what people say because it's reaching so many and it's just, it's, it's, it's a tough one. But all you can do is just keep giving opportunity for the artist to write and record and keep them motivated and wanting to put out a body of work which is coming this year that will, you know, kind of shut the haters up. And if it doesn't, then everyone's entitled to their opinion. You just move on, smile and wave and don't let that negativity affect what you're doing or your vision and you just got to stay focused on the end goal and that's if you want to sell out shows globally or if you want to stream a billion or if you want to get a big sync or if you want to you know play x festival or be on tv or whatever like you've just got to stay focused on what they want to do at the start revisit the goals and and keep keep striving towards it and just don't give up like a lot of people give up too soon and um yeah we're just getting started with the tones and i story for sure yeah, well, and, you know, best of luck with it, too. I mean, it's, it, it is, you clearly are past the one-hit wonder point because you have had, you know, more hits that, that even on, on their own have, would be, you know, regarded as pretty successful singles. So, um, yeah, it, you may have escaped that curse, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, um, we'll see. So, do you think, it's been interesting, you know, we were talking before, before we did the interview, you know, that back in the day to break America out of Australia was a really significant investment of time. You know, artists had to tour constantly in North America, managers had to relocate to North America or the UK. Is it different now? I mean, it's obviously we've got COVID to deal with, but we're also living in a much more digital connected world. Um, you know, artists break on Spotify globally. Do, do you think it's sort of easier to be successful out of Australia now? I wouldn't say it's easier, but I definitely think it's... You, a song can come from anywhere now, and that's the beauty of streaming, and whether it's the Nordics or whether it's somewhere in Europe or Australia or, I mean, New Zealand with Lord and Benny or whatever, like, the people decide now and, and they can share things around. Or, I mean, it was SoundCloud and, and I know, obviously now it's, um, you know, Spotify and Apple, that sort of stuff, YouTube, and I just think after Gautier, obviously, with his global... I mean, that's 
still just such a crazy, big, beautiful song. I think that was kind of a kick the door down moment for Australian artists and there was a spotlight shone, just like with Lord in New Zealand, there's always those moments and triggers, but I definitely think that um, a song can come from anywhere and that's, it's the best, in, in my opinion right now, is the best time to be in the music business, it's the best time to be an artist writing music and releasing it on your own terms and you can get favourable deals, you can put it up on Ditto for example and have 100% royalty or you can get skinny distro deals with some of the bigger labels or some of the indies, like, you've got to find something that works for you. Um, but it's the most exciting time, I think, to be in the music industry ever because the labels are making a lot of money on the catalogue, so there's money to reinvest, there's money to market, or you can get a home studio and invest uh, in, in that way and just have your output. And if they're good songs, they're going to catch on. Cream rises to the top, people are going to notice. And it might start with an agent reaching out or a, a promoter or it could be anything. It could just be that one spark and once you've had the 100 no's, you get the one yes. Just got to grab it with both hands and turn it into a little snowball, basically. And and once you get that blink of momentum, you just can't let it go ever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose all of that's true. I, I, but I suppose I also look at the 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 last few years have seen a proliferation of artists because it's quite easy to have your music put up on Spotify. So there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of artists. Um, 40,000 a day. Know, yeah, how many, Spotify. sorry? 40,000 songs a day uploaded on Spotify. Yikes. Yeah, it's a lot. So not all of those artists are going to be successful. No, absolutely. That, obviously, yeah, there's... Yeah, the, the, again, there's two sides to every coin. So the consumption's gone up, the, the, the output's crazy, and you've got to have a story or a song or a moment to cut through or a sync. As I said, it can be anything. You just need that moment. And when you get it, you need to be... Make, you need to make sure that you, you're good so that when you go out and play live, that word spreads that you're a decent live act. It, it just boils down to what you want to do. But yeah, everyone, there was a stage where everyone had a laptop on a home studio, but then, I mean, it's just, that's, that's a great thing if people are being creative and creative minds are getting together and, and making music. I mean, that can only be a good thing. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of music around and you've got to cut through the noise, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I, I still think it's... Um it's an interesting challenge and, and a daunting challenge for every artist, but uh, I guess no one ever said it was going to be easy. That's good, that's good in a way. I mean, there's not a certain amount of people in power controlling what gets heard. They don't have these, like back in the day, when it was like, that's the priority, marketing budget, bang, MTV priority, whatever. It's like it's, again, like the streaming services, the data in the back end shows what's working and what's not, and it can be an unsigned artist from Egypt, you know. It doesn't have to be the big marketing push out of the US or something. So um, I think that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely is. And, and does that mean an, an, a manager like you needs to spend less time jumping on planes and, and going to the other side of the world? Well, obviously with COVID, yeah. I mean, there's now it's um, a lot of Google Hangouts and phone calls. I mean, we were doing that anyway. But yeah, it's definitely, we were, I think, three times to America and, and Europe the year before COVID. So. But I've got a young family as well, so it's, the work ethic's still there, but I just don't travel as much, so um, everyone's per personal circumstance is different. But I miss, I miss live gigs like No Tomorrow, yeah. You're kind of lucky that you, you had your family at a moment in time where the technology sort of caught up. Uh, oh, exactly, yeah. I mean, back in the day, you had to beat the doors down, yeah. Yeah. So uh, something I wanted to ask you about is, is you know, we, we occasionally, well, not even occasionally, quite frequently, um, you read stories of bad behaviour in the music industry, inappropriate behaviour from executives or managers. Uh, and you know, just a few days ago, there was all these stories about Marilyn Manson, but you know, there's, that's only one of many such stories. And uh, I was talking to a, um, someone in the music industry the other day, and they said, why is it that women are the only people who ever get asked this question? So I thought, well, I mean, you're a man, you're sitting here, so I'll ask you. So have you ever encountered anything like this? You've got a lot of female artists. Has this ever come up for you? Not, obviously not personally, but we're, we're at Lemon Tree, we've, we're predominantly female staffed. Uh, and the majority of our acts are actually female as well. So we are just trying to build, we can control what we can control, and that's to build a positive and inclusive working environment and with a big focus on mental health and we're focusing on that as much as we humanly possibly can. Um, but I think with that, 
all that sort of stuff. You get found out pretty quick and fish rots from the head and if something stinks and you hear about a certain something about someone or and people are talking about it, obviously it's um, incredibly disturbing. But no, I've never witnessed it firsthand. I've heard things and it's fucking disgusting to be honest. But at the same time, if it's not from the horse's mouth and they're not going there saying that wasn't me or that was me or... It's the, a lot of it can be hearsay and that can be dangerous as well, but um, there's no space for it, there's no time for it, and it needs to be weeded out and it needs to be stopped. Mm. So if, if it's still happening, which, I mean, in 2021 with phones and all that, I mean, you'd be a brave man or woman to be doing that sort of stuff. I think it's safe to say it's still happening somewhere. Yeah, it's, <coughs> it's disgusting. If I was a betting man. Yeah. Um, let's just talk again about, we, we sort of touched on it briefly before, but mental health is a big focus at the moment in the industry. Um, you know, Support Act is doing a lot of really great work to uh, identify um, or help people to identify mental health issues before they become really problematic. Um, and there's a lot of research that suggests that musicians uh, are prone to mental health challenges perhaps more than the normal population or the rest of the population uh, for a variety of reasons, many of them to do with just the difficult challenges of being a musician. Um, What's your view on that and what should the industry be doing about it? I mean, I, in, my, in my opinion, you can never spend enough money on mental health and trying to go direct to the artists, direct to the teams and asking them personally what their challenges are. Um, more time and more resources. I mean, it, it's a huge thing for us. It, it, but, I mean, I know Support Act recently got $10 million and that was like a lifeline for a lot of people. Um, there just needs to be more investment and... I think people like Tom Larkin and Support Act and a lot of people that are out there basically taking away the stigma, that's been a huge step and that's kind of in the last year or two. It used to be people like embarrassed to talk about it, but the reality is most people in this room have had some kind of mental health, whether it's anxiety or depression, or at least at the very least know someone. It's a very real thing and especially with phones and all that sort of stuff that everyone's addicted to now. It's it's um it's full on and I don't know, you can never spend too much money on something like this and, and at least it, it's being talked about more than ever and there's action being taken. Well, I think, I think traditionally the music industry dealt with it by people sort of self-medicating, but... Um... Well, that's the thing, you've got creative minds on the road, there's alcohol everywhere, there's often drugs, there's all sorts and at, the creative mind's a beautiful thing. The artists are not wired like the average nine to five Joe, you know, it's like they're built differently. They get inspiration, they write music, they're, they're wired different. So when you're put in those situations where you're exhausted all the time or up at 6 a.m. for a flight or you're playing to 10,000 people and then the next day you're in a hotel room by yourself in the middle of nowhere away from your partner, your family, your dog, it's a very vulnerable, can be a very vulnerable situation and that's why it's so important to have the team on the road being super supportive and not and just surrounding them with as much, you know, some, some artists just don't like to be left alone, others like to be left alone. It's just figuring out what is right for your artist and just doing all you can to support. Because I think, the, the, you know, the kind of old model of a manager was almost like a slave driver, but that's not really kind of compatible with what you're just describing. No, it's the opposite. As I said at the start, it's like we work for the artist and I think a lot of people, those blur lines are blurred. Whereas the manager comes in and it used to be like, oh, you're going to do this. You're gonna, it's like, I mean, we sit down and say, what do you want to do? Like, everyone's different. And that's a huge thing. And if you get that right at the start and, and, and you build that trust, then you can do amazing things. Yeah. So you've kind of, I mean, I don't know how you feel about this. It feels as if it's almost impossible to imagine you having more success with one song than you've already had. It's, it's kind of, you've already reached the top of the mountain in a way. Well, yeah, uh, tone, tones did. Yeah. yeah. We're just like clinging on for the ride, yeah. <laughs> so, but you've, you know, you're, you're still expanding your company, you know, your family of businesses, you've, you're signing more artists, you're, you're, you're doing more stuff. Where do, where do you see this ride going from here? I mean, just signing great, talent like we'd love to pick up another couple of acts this year that if, if the shoe fits and it feels good we want to grow our staff by you know two or three and and really support our our managers throughout the company and give them as much love as we can and making sure that they're looked after um and just having that global outlook and just having 
when a negative thought comes into your head of, oh, you can't do that, it's like, well, we, why not? And just working out a way of how to get to where they want to go and not giving up and um, just always coming back to why you got into music in the first place, and that's to write songs, to have fun. It's, you've got to enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, you're in the wrong gig. And as a management company, and obviously from the, from the live side as well, you've got to just keep reassessing where you're at and why you're doing it. And if you're in it for, for money, then you're in the wrong industry because often it can take years and years and it's a, it's a really hard slog. But um, yeah, I just, I just look at the future as being pr pretty exciting and, and there's no limit to where it can go. I don't, I don't know. I just think with streaming and everything on the up, that's nowhere near the peak. I think the live boom's going to come around either 22 or 23. And that'll be a great five to ten years. I, I, I just think we're at the beginning of something really exciting. And hopefully we can find a way to do it where it's safe for everybody and everyone stays healthy. Indeed. So we're almost at the end. But I, I guess I, I just wanted to ask you, you know, obviously a lot of people who are watching this or, or watching it later are aspiring artists or, or songwriters and who have enjoyed, at this point, no success whatsoever, and no airplay, and, and no streams, uh, or very few. So, can you offer them, is there any kind of generic advice that you can offer to all of those people about how they should approach their careers? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I mean, first and foremost, don't give up. That's the main thing, and just never stop writing, never stop working to whatever goal is in your mind of what you want to do. And no matter what teams are set up around you or the money spent on you or what is promised to you, it all comes back to the song. And that often gets overlooked. The power of a song, a song can literally change the world. That sounds so cheesy, but it's so true. And the power of a song is often underestimated. And I would just say, yeah, just, just write as much as you possibly can, play on every street corner, Beg for gigs, you know. Go to your gig, immerse yourself in your local scene, so you're being friends with like like-minded artists and build a, like a community where you're supporting each other. Try and get on supports for bigger tours. Just n you know, never give up learning and just be a sponge essentially, and find mentors that want to take you under their wing. Like learn as much as you possibly can about everything about the music business, but don't let uh, don't let that side overtake your creativity and your art and um, get in the way of anything that you want to do as well. It's that, it's that fine line. Yeah, someone was asking the other day, you know, that they were posing that the challenge was how do I get my music heard? And I wonder if that's the right question or whether the question is how do I make sure that my music's good enough to be heard? Because, because it's, the problem isn't being heard. The problem is do you stand out when you finally do get heard? Yeah, I mean, this, I mean obviously Unearthed and Spotify, but just like we do fun things. Like I do the kid test. Like I play it to my three-year-old and... There's some songs where you're like, oh, this is, oh my God, this is incredible. And then you play it, she's like, I don't like that. <laughs> and then there's some songs where you're like, oh, I'm not sure. And then, you know, she'll just dance and lose it. The kid test, it's a real thing. Um, or just obviously trusted friends, parents, people that you trust that are going to give you an honest opinion. And if it's not quite there, then give you some kind of constructive criticism. I oh, like that part in the chorus. And then maybe put that at the front. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, there's, everyone finds their ways of, um, working out what's going to work or not but yeah it's the, the reality is no one knows and if, if everyone knew then we'd all be doing it yeah there'd be more tones and eyes if everyone but knew everyone how to do would be, it. exactly yeah, exactly yeah um mate this has been a really enjoyable chat and you've shared so much valuable insights so um thank you thank you very much for having me yeah. appreciate it thanks mate